Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us this morning for our presentation on our English Pathways to Mount A. My name is Daniela Fernandez and I'm the Manager of International Pathway Programs and I'm here with my colleague, Mark. Mark, if you'd like to introduce yourself, go ahead. Good morning, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Mark Lazanowski, I'm the Manager for International Recruitment and Admissions here at Mount Allison, so pleasure to be here. Perfect. So what I'd like to do today is I'm just going to go through a presentation just to cover uh, some of the overviews of the two programs that we're going to be talking about. And then there's going to be a little bit of time at the end for our Q&A. So feel free to think of some questions throughout the presentation and we can happily discuss them at the end. Oh, Mark, if you would allow me to share my screen once again, please. Oh, goodness. Let's see. If we can, <laughs> yeah. All panelists need to be able. There we go. And does it work for you now? Yes, it does. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so once again, thanks everybody for being here. We're just gonna go through a little bit of a presentation to cover our English language pathways to Mount Allison. And again, our names are Daniela and Mark. So the presentation is just gonna cover a little bit of an introduction, talking about the context as to why we've decided to offer these English pathway programs in-house and what they can do for you. Then we're gonna talk specifically about our new summer pathway program, which is about to launch this summer. Then we're gonna talk about our English academic bridging program, which is a program that we have been offering in house for about four years now. Uh, and then at the very end, we're gonna cover a little bit about the admission process, what the requirements are to be eligible for these two programs and what steps you might need to take to confirm your choice if you have already applied and you're still sort of trying to decide which one might be a better fit for you. So first of all, our English pathway programs are designed to help students from non-English backgrounds to transition smoothly into full-time studies. The idea is that these programs allow you to have a little bit of extra time, training, support, and preparation so that you can be successful in your academic program of choice. And of course, your, also your social and community involvements at Mount a and beyond. So the idea is that these two programs allow you to meet our language requirements so that you can receive a full unconditional admission offer. And we offer two in-house pathway options, uh, depending on your own level of English. So the very first one that I'm going to talk about is our summer pathway program. And then I'm going to step into the English academic bridging program. So for short, I call them SPP and EAB. So if I use the acronyms, at least you sort of know what I'm referring to throughout the presentation. So the very first one, which we're really excited about, is our summer pathway program, the SPP which is a brand new cultural and academic immersion program that we're launching this summer. It's a program that we're offering in partnership with MBCC, which is the New Brunswick Community College. So at this time, students going into MBCC in September and coming to Mount a are both going to be together uh, through the summer, focusing on level specific English and academic skills courses. But the idea is that the program is also full of immersive activities and field trips that allow you to have an introduction to the history, culture, and people of Atlantic Canada. And the idea is that the experiential and community-based learning that happens throughout the program to complement the language classes that take place in the morning, allow you to prepare for full-time studies, especially because experiential and hands-on learning is something that we focus on here at Mount a and that we do really well. And we want to give you as many chances as possible to put in practice in the real world, whatever you're learning in the classroom. So that's something that's really exciting about the program itself. It's not just language classes. There's plenty of opportunities to get out in the community, to visit other, or other parts of New Brunswick itself, potentially other parts of Atlantic Canada, depending on how things evolve this summer with public health regulations. But in general, this presents a really great opportunity for you to learn about Canadian issues in general and to build networks with other international students going to MBCC before the start of your program in September. Now, the Canadian issues part is important and we really wanna put an emphasis on the cultural curriculum of the Summer Pathway Program, um, because you know these are topics that you're inevitably going to be discussing in your lectures and your academic courses here at Mount a. So things like indigenous issues, Canadian American relations, Canadian geography, uh, equity, diversity and inclusion, mental health, things like that. So we're hoping that the Summer Pathway Program is gonna be a really good opportunity for students to create a safe space to have some of these discussions that may be brand new to you, but that we know are going to be hugely important and quite relevant in your programs here at Mount a. Now, the length, duration, and cost of the Summer Pathway Program do depend on your own level of English. So we have three different levels of entry into the Summer Pathway Program. 
The very first one being the entry into our 12th week program. So that's the longest summer program we're running this year. The idea is that students with a TOEFL score between 50 and 60, an IELTS score of 5.5 with no bad score lower than 5.0, or a Duolingo score, for example, of 80 to 85. These are the students that are eligible to be admitted into the program starting in June, going all the way to August. This year specifically, we're offering the very first month of those 12 weeks fully online. And the reason we're doing that is because there, we know that there's extra challenges this year in terms of potentially making travel arrangements to get here to New Brunswick. So we just want to allow you a little bit of extra time so that you can apply for your study permit and make travel arrangements to get to campus to participate in the in-person components of the summer pathway. Then the next cohort can start for the eight-week program. These would be students that are uh, that have a score of TOEFL between 65, sorry, 61 and 78, IELTS 6.0 with no bad score lower than 5.0, and Duolingo scores between 85 and 95. These students would get here in July and they would continue studying in August. So they would join the cohort that started for the 12-week program and they would continue evolving through the language classes together. And then we have the four-week program uh, for students with a TOEFL score between 79 and 89. IELTS 6.5, no band score lower than 5.5, and Duolingo scores between 95 and 100. And these students would come here for the month of August to participate in the emerging component of the program for those last four weeks before the start of classes in September. So the idea is that whichever level of the program you enter into, um, the idea is that you, if you successfully complete the program requirements, and we know that your level of ability has improved enough so that you're ready to take on full-time studies in English, at the university, then we would give you full admission the following term, so for September, um, so that there's no need to write additional TOEFLs or IELTS exams, and then you can begin your full-time studies in September, taking five courses per term towards your program. Now, in the event that perhaps you're not successful through the Summer Pathway Program, or you choose to continue to have a little bit more academic support, time and preparation so that you can feel fully ready and empowered to take on full-time studies. We can also give you the opportunity to continue from the summer pathway into the English Academic Bridging Program, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. But in case you're curious, this is what you can expect your week to look like as a summer pathway program student. So you would have classes from Monday to Friday, Every morning from about 8.30 to 11.30 a.m., you would have your language-focused classes, so your English, like level-specific English classes. Then there would be a lunch break, about an hour, an hour and a half. And then the idea is that Tuesdays and Thursday afternoons, um, that's going to be your independent study time. So that's time for you to complete your homework assignments, do your readings, um, you know, prepare presentations that might be required of you by the instructor. And again, continue to practice your own English with your peers and out in the community. Monday afternoons, they're going to be instructor-led activities. So again, that could be the instructor just creating an activity for the group to follow, inviting guest speakers to come in, or maybe perhaps doing experiential learning activities in and around the community. Wednesdays is the day that we've designated to do our weekly field trips or experiential learning activities. So that's pretty exciting because that's going to be an opportunity for our students to visit, you know, different beaches, national parks, houses of government, historical places, uh, farms, community businesses. We want to give you a really well-rounded introduction to what New Brunswick is about and what you know the maritime provinces offer in the summer. So that's gonna be a really exciting component of the program to help you once again, put into practice what you're learning in the classroom. And then on Friday, it's an opportunity for students themselves to lead activities. So one thing we're really trying to do with building the Summer Pathway Program curriculum is to allow students to also bring their own interests into the program. If there's a specific topic or a subject you're really interested in or something about Canada that you really want to find out about, then this is a great opportunity for you to sort of put that topic together and again, invite guest speakers, create presentations, games, plan extra little field trips around the community. So some of your independent study time during the week is also going to allow you to prepare for facilitating an activity for the group on Fridays. So this is what your week can look like in the Summer Pathway Program. Now we're going to talk about the English Academic Bridging Program, which again is kind of like the continuation of the Summer Pathway during the academic year. So the English Academic Bridging Program has been designed for students whose English proficiency is just below the minimum that we require for unconditional admission.
It is a two-term program that runs during the academic year, so between September and May, during the fall and winter semesters. And this allows you to enroll in up to three academic courses at the same time as you complete two non-credit courses in academic English and academic skills each term during your first year at Mount A. The idea is that we're also able to offer peer tutor support to make sure that you understand the lectures, the required readings, and the assignments in your academic courses that you're enrolled in. And there's also an additional focus uh, on time management, work-life balance, mental health, and community involvement. Um, so this is a great support for you, again, as you make a transition into full-time academic studies in English and into life and culture in Atlantic Canada once you start your program here. So I'm just going to show you a little bit more detail, like the, the sort of structure of the EAB program. So once again, each term during your first year at Mount A, you would be taking three academic courses. We pre-register you in specially supported courses based on your intended bachelor program. And the reason we do this is just because we simply know that there's a certain amount of courses or a certain type of course that's a little bit more likely to be, you know, an easier transition for students that are just sort of getting used to doing academic readings in English, academic writing in English. So there's a few courses that we know are kind of a better and easier introduction to academic studies at Mount A. So we take care of your course registration if you're an EAB student uh, for that first year at Mount A. There's also the two non-credit courses, which again are full year courses. And these focus specifically on academic skills and academic English. And when I say academic skills, we're talking about things like learning how to summarize, how to paraphrase, how to use library resources, how to cite academic sources, things like that. So that's going to be hugely important for you, no matter what subject area you're focusing on. Um, so that's going to be a really good foundational preparation for you to move forward into full time studies. And once again, there's added academic support that's built into the program via the peer tutors that are assigned to you for each of your academic courses. You also have additional support through the writing and math resource centers at the university. And the EAB instructor is able to provide individualized feedback for you on your assignments so that you know exactly what areas you need to improve, where you might need to make adjustments so that you can then be more successful academically in your academic courses at Mount A. Now, for the, academic bridging, for, for the English Academic Bridging Program, the eligibility um, includes students that have a TOEFL score of about 80 and IELTS 6.0 or Duolingo 100 to 110, but students can also choose to opt into the program. So regardless of whether you've already met our language requirements or not, you can choose to participate in the English Academic Bridging Program if you think this is something that's going to benefit you and you want that additional year um, just to have extra time, support, and preparation before you jump full time into five courses per term uh, towards your degree. The idea then is that if you meet the EAB program requirements within those two terms, then you would receive full unconditional admission the following term so that you can again continue with full time studies towards your diploma and no additional TOEFL or IELTS test would be required as long as you meet the program requirements within the structure of the EAB. So uh, basically the admission process for either one of these pathway programs sort of starts the same way. The idea is that you would first need to apply to Mount A. So if you haven't done so, please go check out discover.mta.ca. This is a place where you can create an account and stay on top of news, events, admission events, things like that. And also submit your comprehensive application for admission and scholarships at the same time. And of course, as an international student or a student from a non-English background, we would generally ask that you submit your proof of English proficiency. So based on that, our admissions team would look at your scores and your level of ability and recommend the best program for you based on your own skill level. And then once you receive that conditional offer asking you to still meet our language requirements, um, you kind of have a couple of different options. So you can choose to apply for the Summer Pathway Program if you're eligible for one of the three entry points. In that case, there's an extra application form and there would be a deposit that needs to be paid this year by April 1st in order to confirm your spot in the Summer Pathway Program. Or perhaps if you're offered directly into EAB, um, you simply need to pay your registration deposit to confirm your spot and your interest in participating in that program during your first year at Mount A. So I've listed a couple of different links here, mta.ca slash English requirements. That's the page that shows you the scores that we require for admission, 
but also the different types of tests that we accept. Yes, we accept Duolingo, we accept TOEFL, IELTS, all the traditional tests that you know most universities also accept for admission requirements. MTA.ca slash English Pathways is the one site where you can find out all the information about the SPP application, the different costs of the program, eligibility requirements, deadlines, et cetera. And then of course, you can always reach me at English Pathways at MTA.ca. If ever you have any questions, you wanna know how to opt into the programs, the content of the programs and the courses, perhaps, things like that. So that's kind of all I got for you today, but this is a great opportunity to ask us some of those questions if you already have any in mind. So I'm opening the floor for questions if there's anything else at this time. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Daniela. So if any of you have questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box or in the chat. Uh, regardless of the topic. So obviously we're here today to talk about English Pathways, but if you're curious about what summer is like here, if you're coming for the Summer Pathway Program and some of the opportunities of some of the things you can uh, undertake while you're here and how that relates to your academic year. If you are curious again about any of the details of SPP or EAB, uh, that's what we're here to, to answer for you today so just let us know Daniela. i might start you did mention and i got kind of excited myself but the the summertime if we're here for the summer pathway program uh, you know one of the things i often say to students when they come to mount allison and they don't do the summer pathway program is that you come here and typically you arrive at the end of summer um it's it's september and then or august late august and then you're here until april and just as things are starting to warm up the, the academic year ends. So it's really nice to be able to enjoy sort of what I think is the nicest time of year here, although all times right. of year are nice. Can you talk <laughs> about a few of maybe even your favorite activities in the region and some of which I suspect will either be in, uh, rolled into the plans for SPP or which students will be able to sort of pursue on their own while they're here? Yeah, of course. I mean, we have lots of different ideas for how to integrate, you know, these visits and these field trips into the cultural curriculum of the Summer Pathway Program, because we do think that if students have an opportunity to learn more about the context that they're going to be studying in, they could find new passions to pursue, they could find new activities to really feel at home and enjoy being here in the Maritimes with us. Some of my favorite things to do in New Brunswick are anything that has to do with nature. I think that's probably the most beautiful part of being in New Brunswick. It's just an opportunity to go hiking, camping, exploring beaches, remote trails, going into the forest really at any season, just to have a sense of peace and connect with nature. Um, I also love in summertime, just the farmer's markets. Um, I think it's just the best time to eat and enjoy beautiful local food, fresh foods things that maybe you've never tried before, um, local fruits, ice creams, maple, maple syrup in spring, like lots of different things that I love to just taste. Um, so I think we wanna be able to sort of bring those experiences into the Summer Pathway Program for students as much as possible, especially because we know that that's a time of year where, just like you said, students are not always present in the community. So this is a great opportunity to kind of bring up some of those treasures uh, in the region. And I think, the location of our university is is just privileged in a sense like within a couple of hours each way we're surrounded by national parks different trail systems beaches um, you know we're no less than like two hours away from prince edward island we're right next door to nova scotia so it's also a great starting point for students who want to travel a little bit about the region and just get to know the area and i think like i said that also inspires a little bit more about what they could learn, what kinds of topics they want to explore, um, you know, what kinds of communities they may want to carry out case studies in or do research in. So I think it's just a really good starting point for them to understand how they can focus on different parts of um, their academic program, thinking about the context that they're surrounded by as well. Great, and so just for everyone's benefit there, I put up on the screen, hopefully you can see it. Thank you. Um, a satellite view of our area so that you can sort of get a picture of because as Danielle says, and I think she says it very well, we I feel like in Sackville, we're in a very privileged position here. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great way of putting it. So as you can see on the map here, it's hard to see the provincial borders, but this is Prince Edward Island off to our northeast. 
And then to, immediately to our south, about a five minute drive from here is the province of Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as, as um, Danielle mentioned, within about two hours, and so two hours, if you can follow my mouse as it goes around the screen, within two hours, <laughs> you can get to a lot of places here. Oh yeah. Uh, and in the many cases, a lot less than two hours. So even if I zoom into our local area a little bit, Danielle mentioned national parks. So Fundy National Park is just over an hour away to our southwest and has tons of untouched forest, waterfalls, as you can see coming up in the image as well. Um, and we actually have, even within our same region, we have a second national park, which is hiding on this map. There is Kujbaquak yeah. National Park. Um, which uh, has a landscape that's unlike any other really in Canada that you mm -hmm. find there. Um, just on the outside of Kujibakwak National Park, we also have one of our um, largest Indigenous communities at El Sabuktuk. So this is an important part of the culture in Absolutely. Canada. So you get to have that exposure and you have all along this coastline and throughout our, our, um, our province and throughout our region uh, is a very large French speaking population as well. So don't worry if you do not speak French. We know that we're here to talk about English <laughs> pathway programs today, but you really get a lot of exposure to that culture as well. Um, and then we are also, of course, not far from the city of Moncton. And so, the, uh, you know, Moncton is, is a small city. It's our largest city in New Brunswick, but it's a small city. Um, mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, in the same way that Sackville is a small town where you are able to really uh, get to know people and we have people who come from so many different places to attend Mount Allison. Moncton is also a center where people from all over the world are, are coming together, mm -hmm. um, because, partly because it's a, a actively bilingual city. There's English and French spoken all over the place um, and people coming from all over uh, to really add their energy and their ideas there. So it's exciting and it's about a 25 minute drive from Sackville. So it's very, very close. And so there are lots of opportunities to get out and do things. PEI, I you know, is world famous for many reasons. You can drive there from Sackville in about 40 minutes. Um, and then you have lots of opportunities there too. So really it's a great region that we're very fortunate to, to have access to. Um, and of course, even here in Sackville, uh, there's no shortage of things to keep you busy. So I've been here in Sackville pretty much nonstop here for about a year now. Um, and just within our very local, so Moncton I mentioned is 25 minutes away. So if I zoom in even further, um, we have some great hiking that's available in our region. We have, um, as you can see, this water, don't be put off by the water. I know it looks brown. Um, that's the Bay of Fundy and it has the world's highest tides, but that's also a really interesting feature because that water goes up and down about 13 meters every, uh, six hours it goes up and six hours it goes back down um, so we really have this this tremendously unique landscape that every time you turn in a different direction um, the landscape is different but also the people are different and so it's uh it's a, a particularly interesting part of the world i think and i've i've been fortunate enough to travel to very many places um, so something that i hope that lots of our students will be able to uh, take advantage of as well absolutely so, yeah, so I'll take that back off. We'll probably bring something like that up a little bit later, but I see there's some questions. Um, so I am curious to know, um, uh, or, well, I guess one of our attendees, I should say, is curious <laughs> to know, are there going to be language proficiency tests at the end of the SPP program or SPP so that I can show that I've officially completed the program? So Daniela, how does that work when the summer is over? So yeah, basically, just like you would have with any academic course, uh, there would be probably a final test just to try to help us understand how much your language abilities have come up and how much you've improved and whether or not you're actually ready to step into full time studies in September. Um, so yeah, there would, there would be some type of assessment, but you're not going to be required to pay and, and register to write another TOEFL or IELTS test. It would be a test that we would handle internally, just like you would have with any other language course at the university. Great. And so then just to, to make sure everyone's clear, if a student gets to the end of SPP, and let's say they're not quite ready yet, what happens in the next stage in that situation? So yeah, in that situation, we would be happy to allow students to register automatically into our EAB program, which again, it's more like the continuation of the summer pathway. So this allows you to have the first two terms of your degree here at Mount A, 
to continue to have academic support in terms of your language skills, your academic skills, at the same time as you also complete academic courses towards your degree. So this is kind of a great option because it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go and take language courses and then come back. You can stay here with us, you can continue your life and studies here at Mount A, and you can start working towards your degree and take credits that count towards your degree but you're also going to be receiving that extra academic support to help you continue to improve your program throughout that first year. Great, thank you so much. So you mentioned some of your favorite um, tastes of the region, <laughs> or you alluded to them recently. Can you talk a little bit about um, how food works here? So when students come for, well, you know, we're talking about both of our programs here. So can you talk a little bit about Local food, what does food mean here and what options are available for students uh, both during Summer Pathway program and, and then during the regular school year? I mean, in general terms, like Jennings, our dining hall is spectacular. I know that they source a large percentage of their food from local farms and local producers. And I think Mount A has its own farm as well that can also supply part of the food that students would consume at the dining hall which is beautiful. I think it just allows us to really make the most of what our, you know, our region has to offer in terms of natural bounty, but it also reduces the ecological footprint of the university. So that's something important to keep in mind. And, uh, you know, when it's in full functioning form, Jennings Dining Hall, it's a great opportunity to just taste so many different kinds of dishes. We have an all you can eat uh, sort of food setup where you can try vegetarian dishes, dishes from the grill, uh, wood fired oven pizza, continental breakfast 24 hours a day. Um, and you know, they kind of rotate through different cultural menus in a sense to try to cater to some of our different international student populations. So that's a great opportunity to just also diversify your palate and try new things that maybe you had never seen before that you didn't know you were gonna like. Um, but like I said, if you have an opportunity to be here in the summertime, the farmers markets, which Sackville has one, Moncton has a couple like in DF in Moncton, DF is just a city like right next door to Moncton. Those are great opportunities to see things that grow in very short seasons because our summer is fairly short. Um, so just local delights like strawberries, blueberries, um, you know, zucchinis, like I don't know, I'm a kind of like a semi-vegetarian, so like all fresh veggies are just like exciting to me. Um, but you know, the farmer's markets also show you an opportunity to just see local crafts, like things that people make, artisanal products, um, whether that's, you know, indigenous crafts like earrings and moccasins and, you know, leather, candles, like beeswax products, soaps. Uh, there's a lot of that that's, you know, I think very well priced here in New Brunswick. It's a big part of the culture, just artisanal product making and, and use here in the region. So, you know, if that's something that interests you, that you're curious about, um, or that you're curious to check out, then the, summer, the farmer's markets are a great opportunity to also enjoy some of those little delights that can also make you feel a little bit more at home, maybe in your dorm room, just a nice little beeswax candle or something like that that brings New Brunswick into your own space. And Daniela, do you have any, like we have quite a few local restaurants for being in a relatively small town. Um, mm. Am I allowed to put you on the spot and ask you if you have a favorite local <laughs> restaurant? Um, I mean, it's been a while since I've been in Sackville and able to eat like from a broad selection, but uh, I mean, Song's Chopsticks I really like, which is like Korean, yeah, Korean Asian food. Um, Mel's, Mel's Diner is just a classic. Um, it's been there for decades and it's just delicious, like your typical sort of homemade burger, homemade fries, a big tall ice cream milkshake. Um, so it's just like a fun, cheap place to go hang out with friends and have a nice easy meal between classes or at the end of the day. Um, yeah, I guess those would be a couple of my favorites probably in Sackville. But in Moncton, you know, for those of you who are curious, we have delicious Indian restaurants like the Taj Mahal is just a classic, like best Indian food in the region. Um, it's got some competition now with India King. So that's like South Indian food versus the Taj, which is more North Indian food. So the fact that Moncton is diversifying and that more and more immigrants are choosing to settle here is definitely a, a big benefit to those of us that live here in Moncton because we're having to, you know, we have more options to explore foods from around the world and the, and the cultural delights that people bring with them. There's also a couple of really good Asian restaurants. Tokai Ramen is delicious for like an authentic, huge bowl of tonkatsu ramen. 
Um, yeah, there's just awesome things. There's a new Mexican place at the mountain market, Maiz and Mixta, and they do like authentic tacos. Some of them are vegan too. So for those of you that are vegetarian or vegan or for cultural reasons, don't eat meat. Those are great options as well. Um, and like Mark said, I mean, Moncton's really not that far from Sackville. You kind of do need a car to be able to make the trip between the two places because we don't really have like transportation that goes back and forth consistently during the day. But uh, if you make friends with someone with a car, you know, it's a great option to get away on the weekends, come to the mall, do some shopping, come eat, uh, you know, again, culturally diverse restaurants and just enjoy an area that's a little bit maybe more cosmopolitan feeling than Sackville. But trust me, Sackville is an exciting, vibrant place, especially for its size. Like it's the students that make it as vibrant as it is. There's always something going on, something new to try, lots of different cafes, galleries, uh, shows, uh, speakers that come through town, recitals, conferences. You're not going to be bored in Sackville, despite the fact that it's a it's a small town, probably for most of you coming from, I would imagine, large urban centers from across the world. But I think at the same time, many of us have come to Sackville from larger urban centers. And one of the things we find here is, as Danielle, Danielle makes a very important point, you will never be bored here. I often say, <laughs> um, if you are bored, it is your own fault because there are, there are more than enough things to do. And one of the things, although as much I love cities, um, but one of the things that I particularly like here is that you can get access to all of the things that, that you might want to do in a city or most of the things at least, but they're all down the street. So everything, you know, if you enjoy the aspect of a city where you have to go far away and find things and the adventure of that, which I do, <laughs> that aspect is not here because the convenience is here. We have all these different cultural activities and all these out uh, outdoor options and all sorts of things that you can do and they're really at your doorstep. The picture behind me here is, uh, that's York Street. So that picture is taken in the middle of campus um, and if you look down the street basically the cluster of lights you see that the, the the street leads to is the the heart of our downtown area where many of those local businesses are found so it is approximately a three or four minute walk um, from where i'm sitting right now which is in the building behind me down the street there um, and so really you have everything when people talk about like you have it at your fingertips it really very much is at your fingertips uh, here in Sackville. That, and, and at the end of the day, one of the things I really love about that is it means that you get a lot of time back in your day. I think you're able to fit more things in uh, with the time that you have. By the way, this is an open house and we're supposed to be showing you what the place looks like. So yes, that's what we look like. But I also wanted to put up this picture as well. Nice. Um, and the only reason I'm putting it up is because I took it this morning. So if you're wondering what Sackville looks like <laughs> in the winter time, um, this is it. It was. It is. It's another beautiful sunny morning. It is, to be very honest with all of you, probably not. Probably it is one of the coldest mornings that we have had all winter. I believe the current temperature is about minus 14 degrees. Mm -hmm. So nothing that I, a coat and a hat and a pair of gloves will not take care of. And if you're here for summer pathway program. It'll be a, a balmy, uh, well, it Ooh. depends. Anywhere depends. from 15 on up to 25 or 30 degrees in the daytime. Yeah. Uh, it all varies. Here in Sackville, where, as we're right on the ocean, as I showed you before at the Bay of Fundy, um, things tend to be very moderate here. It doesn't get super cold in the winter and it doesn't get super hot in the summer. So it's generally pretty comfortable and you can usually count on a, a refreshing breeze as well. Yes. So, Daniela, there are some other questions here as well that I want to make sure we get to. Uh, as as we've got lots of Curio students with us today. Um, so, you know, we've talked a little bit about the school being small as well, and there are a lot of benefits to that. Uh, but at the same time, would you say, Daniela, that there are any aspects to the, the university or the SPP or the EAB where being small is limiting? No, I don't think so. I mean, in fact, I usually talk about this as an advantage to our international students. Because, you know, we've often met students actually that have transferred to come and study at Mount A, where initially they started off at larger cities and larger universities, and they sort of felt a sense of being lost in the crowd, um, you know, making the transition to come across continents sometimes to come and study here. 
that in itself is such a big disorienting experience that I think being in a smaller community where people know you by first name, where people really know your situation and they're willing to help you and they're willing to show you places and they're willing to give you a little bit of an orientation about how the community works, how the university works, that's an advantage to you. Um, it's very unlikely that you would ever feel lost in the crowd here because again, it's such a familiar place and it's such a welcoming place too in the sense that it's diverse and people are curious about new faces, new students, different cultures, that it's gonna be a place that encourages you to step out of your comfort zone and put your language in practice and meet people and try new things and explore new places. So I think that's a huge advantage actually to being in a smaller community and a smaller university environment is we can actually give more personalized attention, support, and feedback to international students, well, to any student, but in this case, to international students, to help make that transition to full-time studies a little bit more smooth than if you were to just arrive without really knowing anyone into a city of thousands and thousands of people, and sometimes universities also of thousands and thousands of people, where you might not necessarily know who to approach to ask specific questions, or you might not know somebody that can just show you things with a little bit more patience in specific directions. So I think being in a smaller community can be a really big advantage to helping you feel at home, period. <laughs> I think you say it very well. Um, great, thank you so much. So there is a question as well. Um, do residents in Sackville generally speak in English and French? I think probably most people in Sackville speak English, um, but like Mark was showing on the map earlier, I mean, we do have a diversity of cultures in New Brunswick. Um, we have Acadian people who primarily speak French and or Shiak. Uh, we have people who mostly speak English across the province, and we also have people from a Mi'kmaq background that would also speak their own language as well. So, you know, you're likely to encounter these different languages in different regions sometimes, like different pockets of the area. Sackville, for the most part, I would say is an Anglophone town. So people would primarily speak English to you, but there's lots of our students and staff who have Acadian roots. So they would also probably speak French as an additional language and that, and you know, I wouldn't be surprised if you also heard conversations in French here and there at different pockets of the community or the university. But it's not something that you need to know to be successful here right away. Like, don't be intimidated by the fact that maybe you don't have a French background. It's going to be something that you're able to learn and pick up along the way, absolutely. But it's not something that you absolutely need in order to be successful in your program at Mount A, since most of our programs are also delivered in English. When you walk down the street here in Sackville, you mostly hear English. You'll often hear French as well. Many French speakers here also speak English. Many people in Sackville speak uh, multiple languages. But the only one you truly need to be able to succeed at the university is English. But it's nice to have the exposure to the other languages. I'm an Anglophone. My first language is English. One of the reasons I chose Mount Allison for my own studies is that I knew that it was in a bilingual or really a multilingual environment where I would have exposure to French. And so uh, I studied French here, but also I know we're here to talk about English today, but we do offer Spanish and German and Japanese and Latin and Greek on our campus as well. So there are options to, uh, and sorry, and Mi'kmaq, I forget this one, uh, because it's the newest addition to the, the uh, set of classes that we offer the different languages that you can, can choose from. So um, one thing at a time, of course, but we encourage you to take advantage of these opportunities and all of the languages that I just mentioned um, typically are, our curriculum is set up so that if you come here and you have never spoken a word of German, Spanish, Japanese, Latin, or Greek, you can start that uh, class on day one um, without any background. So I, uh, for example, never spoke Spanish before I came to Mount Elson and then studied it here and subsequently was able to live in the Spanish-speaking world. Um, so lots of opportunities in lots of different ways, too. I know a lot of you are thinking about um, the the elephant in the room, to use the English idiom. Um, but COVID-19 is still with us here in 2021 uh, and is continuing to affect our plan. So there is a question here, Daniela. Do students need to be vaccinated before they come to Mount Downs? I don't believe that's the case. I mean, obviously, we would have been hosting students over the past year that were admitted in 2020 that 
didn't have access to the vaccine since it wasn't being rolled out just yet. Um, but you know, what's likely to happen, for example, for the summer pathway program is that this year specifically, simply because of the public health situation we're all in, um, we're probably going to have to build a 14 day quarantine period into students arrival on campus. So it is very likely that the in-person immersive part of the summer pathway program might be reduced for each cohort by a couple of weeks because they might be able to arrive on campus and they can move into residence and be part of you know campus life but they may have to stay in their dorm room and participate in the language classes virtually just for those first two weeks so that we can comply with our with our own public health regulations um, as a university so that's kind of one of the differences um, between this year and regular years at Mount A is that you might have to go through that quarantine period at least to meet um, our public health requirements. And generally, there's an arrangement that the university can make with public health to bring public health officials to the campus to conduct uh, COVID testing as well, which, I mean, in the past, it has taken place around day 10 of students quarantine. Um, so no, I don't believe you have to be vaccinated per se to arrive on campus, but there will still be a couple of different public health regulations you need to abide by just like any other student that's traveling here, even from out of province. This isn't just a requirement for our international students, it's for anyone coming in from outside New Brunswick. So things do look a little bit different this year. And I think one of the key messages for all students, for both the pathway programs and for general admission as well, is just to stay abreast where we will keep you updated. But if you're coming for summer pathway program, your arrival is four or five months away. If you're, uh, if you're coming for EAB or for the beginning of the fall term, we're looking at six months, a lot of things will change in four or five or six months and we will continue to observe the public health guidelines that are in place um, and update our policies. So, you know, in a hopeful world, maybe by the time June, July, August comes around, we'll be in some sort of situation where that self-isolation requirement isn't there. I wouldn't count on it, but we can hope mm -hmm. for it at least. Um, yeah. But I expect that we will continue to see evolving requirements over the coming months, and it will depend entirely on how the situation plays out here. To date, we have been very fortunate and very diligent also here in Mount Allison, in Sackville, and in New Brunswick, and have been, so far, very, uh, I would say, lucky that uh, uh, the virus has almost left us untouched. That also means, in turn, that we must be even more vigilant uh, because everyone here is a potential host, pretty much, because almost none of us has had it already, unlike many other places in the world. Um, so it's something to, um, to think about, but also not to worry about. Um, we have a lot of practice at this now. We had um, hundreds of students who came and self-isolated on our campus in our residences at the exact same time last August and then again last month in January and it was very successful. We now have as well um, a new COVID testing clinic that's here in um, Sackville so students can get to a test very easily um, and, and uh, at any time if there's any sort of uh, medical care required we have a health center on campus, we have a hospital here in town. Um, so nothing that we need to worry about just uh, and this is a, the following message again that I'm repeating applies not just to COVID-19, but everything as you make your preparations to join us at Mount Allison. Keep on, on top of your Mount Allison email account. We send you all of the pertinent information that you need to know there. So as policies or procedures evolve over the coming months, we will send you the updates so that you can prepare. Um, but the reality is, as far as vaccinations themselves are, some, excuse me, themselves are concerned, um, there's no way that we will be able to ensure that every student who comes here will be able to get vaccinated before they come. Some people have a hard enough time getting a test before they get on a, a plane to come to Canada. So stay tuned. Again, those rules may, uh, may evolve. Uh, we are looking forward as well here in the province of New Brunswick. One thing that is, is promising is that students between the ages of 16 to 24 have been identified as a priority group for vaccinations as well. Now that applies to uh, people who are here, obviously, if you're not here, we can't vaccinate you. Uh, but that will be something that I think will have an impact on uh, the way that our, our campus looks in the fall, because as more students get vaccinated, obviously we have to continue to take precautions, but how we'll be able to interact on our campus is going to change. 
and probably quite positively as well. So to move on, to, oh, it, yeah, please. Oh, I was just gonna ask you an admissions related question that I see sure. here on the Q&A. Are SVP or EAB students eligible for scholarship? Yes, so that's a great question as well. So um, students who apply for both of these programs will be considered for scholarships as well. And typically what happens at Mount Allison, we will look at as long as you apply for admission by the 1st of March, so by Monday, and submit all of your required documents as well. So your transcripts, if we require proof of English proficiency, you need to submit that. Uh, and we accept a, a long list of, of different tests for that purpose, or there are other ways to do it in a non-test format as well. Um, as long as you submit those things, we consider every student during the month of March, we sit and we read everyone's application and we think about who we want to offer scholarships to, which is normally most of you. For students in the SPP, if you uh, graduate SPP, or I don't know if the term is graduate, if you complete it successfully yeah. and move into full-time study in your first year, then if you qualify for any um, scholarships based on your high school marks and any performance thereafter as applicable, then you will uh, be eligible for any scholarship that you've been awarded. And then the renewal criteria here for scholarships is typically that you must carry a full course load and then you must uh, get a certain GPA depending on the scholarship, a great point average, so your marks in other words. Uh, for the EAB, it works a little bit differently. You're still eligible for scholarships, but because of the nature of EAB and the way that the, the program is laid out as of this time, EAB students are not eligible to renew the scholarship into future years because you don't have enough academic credits during your first year. These are relatively new programs to us and they're still evolving. So we're always exploring ways to sort of work with those as well. Um, so that's the way that it works at current. Um, so this also means just as a, as a, uh, a a useful thought, I think, for people who might qualify for either SPP or EAB. Both of these programs are excellent. For scholarship purposes, it's a good idea to think about the SPP if it works for you, because it may increase the term of your scholarship so that you may be able to hang on to that scholarship for up to four years as well. Thank you, Mark. That's a great way to put it. Thank you. Um, a question here from one of our attendees as well about how would class for students be arranged? So um, depending on how many weeks the students are enrolled in for, I'm assuming we're talking about SPP here, will the classroom, will the environment, will the instructor change? Um, so if I understand the question correctly and we're talking about SPP, the classes for students this year are going to be taking place probably in a blended format. Um, of course, the SPP, like it's it's intended to be an immersive program. So in a normal year, we would have all students come to campus for the full duration of their summer pathway program. They would be here in classes, in person, participating in class and then taking, you know, participating in the in-person immersive activities in the afternoons. But because this year we know that there's additional challenges with travel restrictions, study permit delays, things like that. We're keeping the program delivery a little bit more flexible. So it's very possible that we may have some students on campus at the same time that some students are taking the same class virtually. Um, so, you know, there may be some classes that are kind of split in that sense where the instructor is going to have to be doing a live lecture to students that are there in person, but the lecture is being broadcast virtually to students joining us from elsewhere. And then once students are able to hopefully travel here maybe later on in the summer they can continue to join in in-person classes and in-person program activities for the eab courses it actually kind of works very similarly i mean it has for the past year most of our eab students in the program over the past year are actually joining us virtually um, so the eab classes themselves they take place at, around the same time that we're joining here today so between 8 30 and about 11 in the morning on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And that's kind of a relatively flexible schedule for students in other time zones. Um, because for students in maybe Europe and Africa, it's about five, maybe six hours ahead of us. Students in China, Japan, India, like it's a it's a big time change, but you know, it's later at night, but it's still an accessible schedule. So the EAB classes do take place virtually in the morning. And then of course your academic classes, I mean it's hard to say. 
you do need to keep a close eye on the timetables once they're published so that you know exactly which class is going to be delivered in what format and at what time. And that's an, like that's a special concern for students joining us from other time zones, because this might mean that you need to sort of adjust your daily schedule just to be able to attend class if it's a class that takes place synchronously, meaning you have to be there at the same time that the class is being offered online. Whereas there's other classes that are a little bit more flexible, they're called asynchronous classes. That means that the class takes place online, it's recorded, and you can access it at your own time on your own schedule. So the, our delivery methods for classes are a little bit varied to, just to try to accommodate different needs, different time zones, different you know, circumstances that students might be joining under. So in our case, in our pathway programs, it's me, I take care of the course registration for all of you. So I'm the one that's kind of figuring out some of those puzzle pieces, trying to find the best courses that work for you, for your schedule, for your degree program, and um, you know, for the delivery method that the university is offering that year for your academic courses. So you know, once your actual admission process is complete and you're confirmed in one of these programs, I would be sort of working semi-individually with you just to kind of figure out what course choices make sense for your situation and to make sure that you can participate fully regardless of where you're joining us from. That's great. Thank you so much, Daniela. And um, Daniela mentioned synchronous classes. Um, I was curious what this online class situation is kind of like. So I myself have registered for a synchronous class this semester. It's actually taking place in a few minutes. And that means that I need to wrap up soon. So this is the last call for any questions from any of our attendees uh, as we prepare to wind up this, uh, this session. I do just want to take a moment to add to Danielle's last comment too and just um, remind everyone or inform everyone if you don't already know, we do not have hundreds of students in SPP or EAB. And that means that we are very nimble. Um, we will have to be nimble. This has been one of the strengths of this entire university is that we've been able to be nimble during this time of the pandemic when the rules are changing and, and, and we have to respond to that. And so the same thing applies to SPP and EAB. And it's one of the biggest benefits, I think. It will be very, you know, we don't know what's coming at us in the coming months. We plan some, we're making a plan A for summer right now, or Danielle is making a plan A. But she also has a plan B and a plan C and a plan X yeah. um, because we don't know what's going to happen, but we are prepared for all possible outcomes. And one of the things that makes it a lot easier for us to be prepared is that we are smaller numbers in this program. So even in incorporating all the Mount Allison students and all the NBCC students uh, who, who might take this course, we're not going to be in a room with scores and scores of people. Uh, whether virtually or otherwise. So if we do have to make changes or we have to uh, tweak the program as we go along because of the global situation, it will be relatively easy to do and shouldn't be too much trouble for anyone involved. So think of that as a plus, I think, as well. That's Danielle, are there any um, last words that like, you'd like to say to students that we haven't already touched on or just anything that you'd like to touch on one more time before we wrap up today? The one thing I would like to reiterate is that, I mean, again, for students that do want to be considered for scholarship eligibility, they should, you know, continue to work on their application, submit everything that's required of them by March 1st, a deadline that's coming right up. But the, the deadline to apply for the Summer Pathway Program specifically and pay that deposit to confirm your spot in the Summer Pathway, we've extended it until April 1st. So I know it's still published on our website that it's March 1st. We literally just made the decision to extend the deadline yesterday. So please stay tuned for those updates. But if you have any questions, once again, englishpathways at mta.ca, that comes straight to me. I'm happy to answer any questions that you still have as you're still making decisions perhaps between EAB and SPP, or if you have any curiosity about the SPP program itself and what it takes to apply, then just reach out to me and I'm happy to help. And of course, for any questions that are about your admissions uh, or your application or anything else, that's why my email address is here. So please do not really, I hesitate to reach out to me. I'm here to provide service to you and answer your questions. Um, and as Daniela says, Monday is coming quickly. So if you're here and you're thinking about applying and you haven't done so already, do it right now. Um, <laughs> don't waste any time on that because we are running out. And then all of your documents that we need 
you should have those documents already. I don't need a transcript from your school today. Um, so you can provide docu, you should have report cards, transcripts, copies. You can send me those copies now. If I need anything else, I'll try and let you know as soon as we can before Monday. But also bear in mind um, that for anyone who's not applying to fine arts or music or really um, counting on a scholarship, we will continue to have uh, the possibility to apply throughout the month of March as well and beyond. Um, so time is not running out for everything just for those particular programs and for eligibility for scholarship programs and for this uh, hour that we spent with you because we're about to wrap up. So Danielle Fernandez, I'd like to thank you so much for your wonderful presentation this morning and for sharing your insights with us. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out everyone to Danielle at englishpathways at mta.ca and I of course am Mark Lazanowski and I'm here to help you as well with any questions that you have. So we're both at your service and we're both so pleased that you joined us today. Please do uh, head back to mta.ca slash open house to see what else is coming up. We have a very full schedule ahead today, lots of options and activities both today and tomorrow and lots of activities that you can do anytime you like on your own schedule in that very uh, asynchronous fashion. So Daniela, yes. thanks once again. Thank you. And and uh, everyone, thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day or a wonderful evening or a wonderful weekend wherever you are in the world <laughs> and we'll be in touch soon. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Take care.